Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. My name is Amanda Briegel. I am a gynecologic oncologist, a citizen of Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, and a consultant to the American Indian Cancer Foundation, who is sponsoring this webinar for you today. So today we're going to talk a little bit about cervical cancer screening. What are you doing and what do my results mean? There's a lot of mystery for the annual exam for individuals who have a cervix and uterus. And I am hoping to spend a few short minutes with you today talking a little bit about the importance of this annual exam, why we're doing it, and how to understand some of the results. So first of all, who needs a well woman or well person exam? Annual preventive health exams are good for individuals of all ages. A pelvic exam for those who have a cervix and a uterus should be incorporated into annual exams starting at the age of 21. Pap smears, which is a form of cervical cancer screening, should begin at age 21. Clinical breast exams can occur every one to three years at age less than 40, and then yearly starting at the age of 40. So let's talk briefly about the clinical breast exam before we proceed with cervical cancer screening. First of all, your provider will do a visual inspection. The things that we are looking for are, are the breasts symmetrical in appearance? Do we see irregularities from one side to the other? Are there any rashes or regular skin changes? Is there any dimpling of the skin? In addition to looking, there's also the physical inspection. So first, pressure is applied to the nipples to see if there's any discharge that comes. Individual is not breastfeeding or chest feeding, there should not be discharge of any contents from the nipple. All breast tissue is then felt either in an up and down motion or circular motion to feel for any irregularities. Many individuals will have their own sort of natural topography or lumps and bumps. This is why it's helpful for individuals to perform their own self-breast exams in the shower or at home where you're comfortable about once a month. That way, if there's something that's new, different, or changed, you can help your provider understand and examine that area more closely. The last part of the clinical breast exam is to also feel the tissue in the armpit. This is where the lymph nodes are. And so if these lymph nodes are enlarged, it may prompt your provider to do further analysis with either an ultrasound um, or a mammogram. The pelvic exam. So we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy since we can't see most of it. So this arrow is pointing to the lining of the uterus. Okay. This is the endometrium. When an individual is pregnant, this is where the baby is. The bottom of the uterus is known as the cervix, and that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about today after we review the basic pelvic anatomy. The cervix is the bottom of the uterus, and it's the thing that dilates when a woman is in labor. This arrow is pointing to the ovary. This is where the eggs are. So when an individual ovulates, this is where they come from. After ovulation, the egg passes to the fallopian tubes, or tubes as they're often referred to. So the pelvic exam is something that many individuals do not enjoy at all. But hopefully by explaining a few of these things to you today, I can help you understand the purpose and what's actually happening. As you can see here, there's an individual who is laying on an exam bed. Their knees are up and you can see that their feet are in these things called stirrups. Often there'll be an, a gown that you wear as well as a blanket that you can cover across your legs to help optimize your privacy. Next, your provider will place a speculum inside the vagina. On the next slide, we'll spend a few moments reviewing the two different types of speculums that providers will use. The speculum is placed inside the vagina, the cervix is visualized, and a brush, as you can see here, is used to exfoliate cells from the, top, from the surface of the cervix. Uh, this brush isn't like a bristle bore brush that you use to clean your uh, pots and pans. It's a pretty gentle, soft plastic and the provider will essentially just brush the surface of the cervix to help exfoliate cells that then can be put in a liquid container and sent to the pathologist to look to see if there's any abnormalities. Many women don't feel anything at all when this happens, and some will feel a little bit of crampy pressure. Spotting can be normal after having a pap smear. So here are two different types of speculums that are used. Neither one is superior to the other. They both have pros and cons to them. On the left here is a plastic speculum. The provider can actually put a light up into here, which then shines into this opening. And the one thing I don't like about this particular kind is when you open it, you hear this clicky click click noise, which never sounds good when you're the patient and you're hearing it. On the right, you see a metal speculum. And this does not have a light attached to it. So your provider will need a light kind of around their shoulder that they can direct into the vagina so that you can see the cervix. Again, neither one of these is superior to the other. 
Um, They're just sort of based on availability and resources at your clinic. One thing to note is that this part here is the only part that goes inside the body. This large clunky part here on the outside, that stays outside the body the entire time. If you look at the speculum when it is closed, um, you'll see that it's about the width of a super tampon. And so it's not as big and fearsome as it seems. So when I'm performing a pelvic exam, what do I see? This is a picture of the cervix. This individual is in the pelvic exam position, their legs in the stirrups, the speculum is inside the vagina, and it's opened up just slightly so that we can see the cervix. And your cervix actually looks like a little pink bagel, okay? So you see this outer part here, and then you have the opening, okay? And there are different types of cells on the surface of the cervix, as well as the opening. And so when a pap smear is done, you exfoliate cells from that outer part. And then there's also a little bit of the brush that goes in here to help us understand what's going on with the cells on some of this inner part. Once the cells are taken off the surface of the cervix, they're placed in a special liquid and given to the pathologist. The pathologist this, then does some simple processing and looks at the cells underneath the microscope. Now here is a um, image of the different types of things that the pathologist can see. Now the cells on the cervix look a little bit like a fried egg. The smaller the yolk, the more normal the cells are. Okay, so you see this would have like a tiny yolk and a lot of egg white. And those are what we call normal results. Okay, you might see the letters capital N-I-L-M on your pap smear results. And that essentially means nothing abnormal was seen. As you see the yolk increase in size, or as your pathologist does, those are more concerning signs for pre-cancer of the cervix, okay? The, the yolk is where the DNA makes changes. And so if you see a lot of activity going on in the center of the cell, that says that something's going on that's making the cell more active and it may be worth watching more closely. Um, so watching more closely could be a repeat pap smear in six months to a year. Sometimes that means an additional procedure called a colposcopy, where your provider will take a much closer look at the cervix using essentially, they're like cervical binoculars, okay, to get a better look to see if there's anything that might need to be biopsied. The next part of a pelvic exam is the bimanual exam. And this part, I feel like is the most mystified part because no one actually tells you what they're doing or why they're doing it. And so again, after the pap smear is obtained, you're still in this pap smear position. And then your provider with gloved hands um, will do an exam and their two hands will talk to each other. So one hand, two fingers will be placed within the vagina to feel the cervix. And then the other hand will be placed on the lower part of the abdomen. And the two hands moving together provide quite a bit of information. So it tells me when I do this, is there tenderness of the uterus or cervix that seems beyond the context of a typical exam? that can be a sign of an infection. What's the general size of the uterus? Most women who are individuals who are menstruating ages will have a uterus that's about the size of your fist or a little bit bigger. When you feel things that are mar markedly enlarged, we start to ask ourselves, why is the uterus enlarged? What are, there, what are the problems with this? Is there a fibroid, which is a benign growth that's pretty common? Is there something else going on that we need to figure out? And then also feeling the ovaries. So often your provider will kind of sweep um, from your like right hip bone to just above your bladder and your left hip bone to just above the bladder. And that's where we try to feel the ovaries. Do they feel enlarged? Are they tender? Are they normal? Things to tell your provider. We try to do the best we can to come to your appointments to help answer your questions and also to make sure we're delivering safe and appropriate care. But we don't know everything. And so there's things that are really helpful for your providers to know and for you to feel empowered to tell them. One, share if you have any history of sexual or physical trauma. When this is in someone's past or in their active living history ongoing, it helps us to know that you might need a little bit more time and empowerment through the pelvic exam. Also, if there are things that we can do to help you feel better, that's helpful for us to know. We do not want to traumatize you when we do these exams. We want to help you. Additional things to tell your provider, discuss your cycles and find out if they're normal. Is the length normal? Is the frequency normal? 
Are you having bleeding after intercourse or between your periods? These are very important things for us to know so that we can help pinpoint if there are things that we need to do to correct them. This is also a good visit to talk about any sexual health concerns. Is there pain? Is there abnormal bleeding? Any concern for infections such as sexually transmitted infections like chlamydia or gonorrhea? It's also a good time to talk about family planning. Are you thinking about expanding your family and becoming pregnant in the near future? Do you want to discuss contraception and um, want to know a little bit more about a method? We're here to answer those questions for you. And any general health concerns that you have, this is the time to bring your list, think about it beforehand, and let us know. At the American Indian Cancer Foundation, we have made two resources for you. One is a My PAP Tools information sheet. This has many of the different things that we talked about in today's talk. We have the thin prep. So this is the um, this is where we put the brush into before we send to the pathologist. There's the gloves that we wear before we examine you. There's gel that we use to help with the exam. And then here's a picture of the two different types of speculums that can be used. And so we have this information sheet for you, and I will give you the link on our website. And the other is to help understand your PAP results. So if you don't have a normal exam, it's good to understand what these things might mean. And this information sheet is to help you so that you can pull this up as a resource after you have your PAP smear results. And so you can go through these and understand the different types of results that there are and what might be necessary for your workup. Um, for your next screening exam. So where do you get more information? You can seek us out at the American Indian Cancer Foundation website. We also have email at health at americanindiancancer.org. And you can click the following two links uh, to get access to those handouts that I had just referred. And so I'm gonna stop sharing. Hopefully this information was helpful for you today. It is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, so if you are not up to date, schedule an appointment with your provider and think about some of the things I talked to you about today. Your health is important.